We have been studying the book of Titus. This is a little letter in the back of your New Testament. It is an interesting letter. It's, it's interesting to me in that it was aimed at, past, as a, at a pastor, but it has tremendous impact for people in the church, the laymen in the church, for the members of the church. And so this is aimed at pastors, but it also has great impact on the life of the church. In the letter of Titus, message eight had to do with the high priority of godly leadership. You can't have a church that is going to be a healthy, faithful church if you have ungodly leaders. And that was part of the problem that was there. We'll see that in just a moment in our review. We talked about last Sunday, or the last time we studied Titus, which was two Sundays ago, we looked at the fact that the first qualification was given, and we'll see that, above reproach. This morning we come to this important, important quality of being committed to faithful love. We're going to see what that means. If you have a review, some of you are new to us this morning. We want you to know where we've been and where we're going, and I want you to see this if you would. Notice on your outline where it says review, you're going to be able to know exactly what we've been, and so this sermon will make more sense to you. Number one, the Apostle Paul is the writer, and Titus, he's the recipient of the letter, they served the Lord together for many years, proclaiming the gospel and establishing local churches everywhere they went. Now, if you look at the screen with me for just a minute, there's the Mediterranean world. Churches were going on the south end of the Mediterranean. That's across North Africa. And they were going around on the north end of the Mediterranean. That's across where we see Turkey and Greece and even over to Italy. You see the yellow circle in the middle. That is an island. And that is the island of Crete. It's kind of a large island, had several cities on it. And we find in this letter that there were churches there. And those churches were messed up. Those churches were not healthy. They were ungodly. They had various doctrines that were there that were a problem. And so Paul is writing to Titus saying, Titus, I left you on that island to help straighten out the churches so that they might become faithful churches. Look at number two with me. There are four things that we've said over the last few weeks. Number one, they constantly, Paul and Titus, had to constantly deal with false teachers. Not just on Crete, but all over the place. They would plant a church and false teachers would often come in behind them. So they had to deal with false teachers. False teachers bring about false what? Very good, false doctrine. They wind up teaching things that are not the truth. And then we also see that they were having to constantly deal with ungodly or worldly behavior. Um, the, the, the church very often would look like the world. And then they had to also deal with this issue of leftover bondage to the Mosaic law. That has to do with those who would come in and say, yes, you have Jesus, but you also still need the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to do this. You need to keep the festivals and all of these things. Those people were called the Judaizers. Now, Paul and Titus constantly had to deal with those things. Now, what I want you to notice about number two is this. That in this day and time, in 2018, we still have many of the similar problems. We still have many false teachers. There's false teachers all over the world teaching in the name of Jesus false doctrines. And that's where it goes to very often in this. In the false doctrines, they, they, they may be very obviously false doctrines. They may be very verbose. There, there's all kinds of cultic worship and various other things that have a, a little thin veneer of Christianity on it. And they may hold up a cross and they may talk about Jesus, but then there's, there's very obvious things. And then there's things that are more subtle along the way to maybe even things like the prosperity gospel is one of the greatest, heres one of the greatest um, contortions of the gospel that is in the world today. And sometimes it is a full-on heresy where the focus is on how to get the things of the world more, how to have health, wealth, and happiness, all with the name of Jesus, a, a positive self-help message that is there. Or maybe even in Southern Baptist churches, there is a subtle, very, very subtle, and you have, to, you have to really look carefully, but there's a moralistic, therapeutic deism. You say, what in the world do you mean? Well, it's about be moral and, and let the therapy of the gospel just kind of 
kind of bring, make your life a little bit better. This is a, a self-help improvement gospel. This is, this is the positive messages that people want to hear that make them feel better about their lives and feel, feel good about it. There's nothing wrong with feeling better about your life. I, I believe that if you really have the gospel, you're going to see the, the way to ultimately feel better about your life. But, but many of the doctrines that are alive today, even in the name of Christ, have to do not so much with the glory of Christ, but more with the glory of man. And that is a very prevalent problem. Um, that while the, na the name of Christ may be mentioned, and the name of Christ may be held, it is ultimately there for your glory, not for the glory of God. We, we must be aware of these dangerous ideologies in these dangerous theologies even alive today for 2,000 years the church has sought to keep Christ in the center of our doctrine keep the Word of God as the center and the basis for which we believe look at number three here Paul's first concern for Titus is establishing godly leadership in the churches of Crete Paul understands that so goes the leadership so goes the church However the leadership goes, that is going to impact the health and the, and the direction of the church. Number four, he begins with qualifications for the elders or the pastors or the spiritual leaders. Those are all the same thing. Overseer, elder, pastor, this is what he's talking about, the pastors of the church. Now, this isn't only the pastors that are quote-unquote paid staff or, or whatever along those lines. These are the ones that the church recognizes as the spiritual leaders of the congregation. And this is, this is of critical importance to our lives in this day and time, not only for the churches of Crete from 2,000 years ago, but for us in our holding on to the gospel and doing things the way God says to do them as opposed to the way man says to do them. Two Sundays ago, we went through all of the, the wrong mentalities about pastoral leadership. The wrong mentality that you can go back and you can listen to that message that there are very, very common mentalities that are not biblical when it comes to what is a pastor, how is a pastor to lead, and what is his influence supposed to be based upon. Look at number five with me. There are, or excuse me, in this, in number four, we talked about the fact that there's two lists in, in Titus and in Timothy. Both of these books have the list of what the qualifications would be like. Number five, both lists begin with the overarching quality of having an upright reputation. Now, the way that the text actually says it specifically is above reproach. This means that those who are to lead the church are not to be able to be accused with any validity concerning their moral life or concerning their reputation um, in their life. And uh, this morning, I want us to look and to see this, and, and you see this grid that is here on the outline. We're studying the letter of Titus, but I want you to see um, both of these lists. It's a very, they're, they're essentially the same list, both in 1 Timothy and in Titus. Look at the screen, if you would, for just a moment. I've circled 1 Timothy. Why don't you do that as well? On the left-hand side, it's 1 Timothy. And then on the right-hand side, it is Titus. Now, I want us to go back and read the Timothy list as we have also read and been studying the Titus list. They're very, very similar, and I want you to notice this. So on the screen in front of you is the Timothy list, and I want you to see what it says very specifically. He says in 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the offices of overseer, he desires a noble task. And here comes the list, number two. Therefore, an overseer, this is a pastor, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, which is our subject today. The husband of one wife. Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, number three, or verse three, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Verse four, he must manage his own household well, 
with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Verse 5. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Look at verse 6. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Verse 7, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. There's the reputation again. He must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. I want you to notice these two lists that are here. They're not so much a a list um, that is to be checked off like a checklist as they are a description. Both of them are describing the kind of person that God says is to lead his body, the church. It's interesting if you just kind of notice the list, kind of look down through um, 1 Timothy versus Titus. Timothy's has more specific items on the list. Titus's leaves off a few things. You see the, the blank line that is there. That means it's not necessarily mentioned in Titus's list. And um, if you kind of look at this a little bit, here's the reason I believe that 1 Timothy's letter was a little bit more detailed is that it, it, in the whole letter of First and Second Timothy, both of those letters, Paul is very careful with Timothy. He's very specific with Timothy. Um, There are longer letters. Um, There are more gentle letters. In fact, if you remember with me in 1 and 2 Timothy, um, Paul writes to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I'm so excited about your faith. I think about the faith of your mother and your grandmother. You know, that Paul knew the whole family. Timothy was, he was really younger. There's reason to believe that Titus was more Paul's age. So he was a little bit older. There's reason to believe that while both of them were with Paul over these many years, Titus had been with Paul through some really tough situations. And in fact, Titus was left behind in Crete in a whole island of troubled churches. And so Titus was really a heavy lifter as a pastor. He was one of these guys that Paul knew, I can send you in and you're going to be able to get this straightened out. So it's almost as if Timothy is the younger pastor that needs a little bit more encouragement, needs a little bit more direction, needs a little bit, things said a little bit more gently. But if you read Titus, there's not a whole lot of gentle, careful words. It is very direct. It is very, and, and I believe that that has to do with the fact that Titus is ready to roll. He is ready to go and to do what he needs to do in helping those churches become healthy. So um, he's he's a bit more of a comrade in arms, um, as so to speak. Um, And perhaps that has to do with the fact that he was a little bit older and been with them. One of the other things that you'll notice in in these lists, notice that both of them start out with what qualification? What do they both start out with at the top of the list? Let's all say that out loud together above reproach. And that is an overarching picture and description that all of the others fall under. That this is to be a man that is not easily accused. This is to be a man who does not have a bad reputation, both within the church or, as we just read in in Timothy, outside the church, um, bringing shame. It's also very interesting to me that Paul is careful to also mention this first one together in both of them. What is the second qualification that falls under that? Husband of one wife. Now that's what we're studying today, and we're going to take just a few minutes and look at what that means and what it doesn't mean. There's been a lot of controversy over the years about what is is that really speaking of? What is he getting at? Why is that so important? We have just sung a hymn that reminds us of why this is so important. What hymn have we just sung? Great is thy faithfulness, the faithfulness of God, the beauty of God's committed love. This is who God is. 
And so we begin to see, and we begin to see why this would be so important, and we begin to see why churches throughout church history should be looking for the kind of leader that God says, the kind of leaders that God says are to be overseeing, leading, caring for his church. Um, as you see the list, and as you let your eyes fall down on both of those lists, it's interesting that the, that the lists go from very personal, increasingly toward a public stance. So they start down at the heart of who this man is, in his most intimate relationship on the earth, which should be to his family, and specifically to his wife, and then it broadens out into wider areas of his reputation. So with that, just keep that in mind, and let's flip the sheet, and let's remember the main text. At the box on the top of the page, it says, if anyone is, we see there first, above reproach, and then I've underlined in that text, the husband of one wife. I want you to see what this actual phrase is. Um, you, you see the Greek phrase, mias ganakos andra. That means literally a one woman man. Mias means one in Greek. Ganakos means woman, and andra means man. If your name is Andrew, if your name is Andreas, it has to do with the idea of man, not just humanity, but man. Uh, there is a feminine form of that. Uh, my own daughter is named um, Andrea. I almost forgot my own daughter's name for a moment. Isn't that just terrible? Andrea. And um, good night. It's been a, a long weekend. But um, Andrea. And so the, the whole picture here is that this actual phrase, and, and you can just mark this down forever in your Christian life, that this actual phrase is, he's literally saying this needs to be a one-woman man. This is a man that has one woman on his mind and on his heart and in his life. It's a rare phrase in Koine Greek. We don't see it over and over again. It's also found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. That's what we just noticed at the top of both of those lists. Notice this as well. It's opposite is found in 1 Timothy 5, 9 in referring to the qualifications of widows. There were widows that were coming into the church. Some of them really needed help and were deserving of help, and there was a problem of some of them coming into the church, and they really didn't need help. In fact, there was some indication that either their family should be taking care of them, they were really not abandoned, or maybe they were manipulators and that they were, they were in, just like there can be men that are, that are doing the wrong thing with their roles and so forth. There, there can be women that are doing the wrong thing with their roles. And so there's a, there's a list given by Paul of saying, hey, if a woman comes in and this is the case, then she needs help. She deserves help. But what one of the phrases that he used here is just the opposite of a one-woman man. He's saying that a widow, if she is a true widow needing help, she is a one-man woman. She is a one-man woman. That, that, that means she's not a manipulator of the men. She's not a player of the men um, that are there because that's very possible. Um, and so he's saying this idea of being a singly-minded person toward the one that God has given. Now, this is an important issue, and I, I want you to see some of the meaning that is here. And um, I want you to notice under the qualifications, this qualifications, a one-woman man or husband of one wife, what, what, is, what is the meaning of this? And the first thing that I want you to see in the meaning of it is that, number one, it does not focus on polygamy. There's some who through the ages said, oh, well, this means that he's, you know, like in the Old Testament, they would have multiple wives. This means that uh, he shouldn't have multiple wives. He shouldn't be polygamy. He should be embracing monogamy, which means one wife. Well, first of all, polygamy was clearly forbidden in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. That really wasn't the issue here. And in fact, in the Greek-Roman world, polygamy was really rejected. 
It was, it was not a big problem. It was not a big issue in the Greco-Roman world. The, even the Greeks and the Romans thought, that's not a good idea. That, that's, that was something that was actually abhorrent around them that was frowned upon. And so I don't believe that this is, this is dealing with the issue of polygamy. There's a second thing that it does not mean. It does not indicate, we should not surmise, that this indicates that an elder pastor cannot be single. Some people would say, well, because he's supposed to be a one-woman man, um, that means he can't be single. He's supposed to have a woman. That's, that's not prescriptive in this. In fact, we would, we would say that the Apostle Paul, perhaps, was single and an elder at the church at Antioch. Um, and so th there's, there's not this prohibition that a pastor cannot be single. Here in the state of Florida, we have numerous pastors who um, were single for a long time. Um, faithful men, godly men. I think of John Cross on the west coast of Florida, um, a man that didn't get married until he married a friend of Marcy and I. Um, uh, it was a, a tragedy in, in uh, uh, the, the other family's life where the pastor was killed in a plane crash and God brought her into John's life and John married her and he suddenly inherited five children if you can imagine that. So you would want to pray for John Cross, but um, they've, they've done well and God has blessed them in that. Um, but we, we're, we're saying that it's not about singleness for pastors. Notice this, number three, it does not indicate that an elder or a pastor widower, circle the word widower, that's a man who has lost his wife. There's a widow, that's a woman who has lost her husband. We don't hear the term widower very often in our modern day society. Um, that seems to be a phrase from years gone by, um, but for the young people in this room, a widower is, is a man whose wife has died. So this is, does not indicate that an elder pastor um, who has remarried cannot do that. You say, well, he had two different wives. Yes. But what we see in both of these lists is it's going after a mentality. It's going after a moral mentality in this man that is more closely related to the character of God and the character of God's love and God's holiness and God's committed nature to us. Um, and so, if you haven't filled it in already up there where it says qualifications, meaning, you can put up there the title of the message, which is committed to faithful love. That's what this is really talking about. This is talking about a commitment to faithful love. So number four is this. The issue is the man's faithfulness to his wife and marriage. That anyone who's going to lead the body of Christ, and this is all going to make sense. You're going to understand spiritually why this is important for Sheridan Hills. You're going to understand why this, is imp this matters to your personal life as a church member in just a moment. But I want you to see this. Number four, the issue is the man's faithfulness to his wife. He must be known as a man purely and faithfully committed to his wife alone. That's what needs to come into people's minds when they think about him and his morality, him and his love life, him and his desires, that he is committed to her. Look at the next part here under number four. He has a reputation, fill it in, of faithfulness to his marriage covenant. Circle the word covenant. This is incredibly important. This is important to God. In a day and time when increasingly the world does not understand marriage or the idea of covenant, we, we're alarmed to see that the world is walking away from this picture that God has given to us. Very specifically, we're going to see that in just a moment. But let me just share with you that you know, many of you know that the pastors went to a pastor's conference in Louisville, Kentucky last week. We were there with 12,000 other people, 10,000 of which were men, 2,000 of which were women. It was a pastor's conference. It was a glorious time. Three days of preaching, three days of singing. It was very powerful. It was a very rich time. We realized that five of us as pastors were scheduled to be on a, the same airplane coming home on Saturday. 
And I got to looking at that. Tommy Chipman and I were in the roommate, in the, he was my roommate for the week. And I said, Tommy, there's supposed to be weather all up and down the East Coast. I don't think all five of us need to be on that plane tomorrow. What if the plane gets delayed? Or worse, but what if the plane gets delayed? You know, nobody's going to be there Sunday to help make sure everything goes well. So I changed my ticket. I came back the night before, um, or excuse me, in, in the afternoon before. And so as, as I was sitting in the, in the airport alone, the other guys were still at the conference, the tail end of the conference. I was sitting there, and I had my earbuds in, and there was a crowd of people around me, and they were, they were from the U.S. military. And as they were talking, I just heard them talking, and one woman is telling about how her, she's in the midst of a divorce, and another woman is talking about her divorce, and then the guy is talking about his divorce. And they're all in the midst of this, and it could have been accountants, it could have been lawyers, it could have been military, it could have been any different group, that was just the group that was there, but they were all talking about their money, and I heard two or three of them say, one of them just exactly this, I just don't get the whole marriage thing. I just don't get it. I mean, it is, and the guy said, it's not, it's all cracked up to be. Now, I was eavesdropping on them and, and listening, and it was not the situation where I could just speak into it. Um, it was, they had their own group going and everything else. But I was sitting there listening to the modern mentality concerning marriage missing the point of what God has designed and what God has given. And the, the picture um, of our modern view that marriage is a thing of the past. Well, that's, that's not at all the case. Um, we need to recognize that this is incredibly important to God. And I want you to see this in just a moment. You see, this reputation that he has of faithfulness to his marriage covenant is seen in this. The last one there I want you to fill in is he rejects all other women. He rejects all other women. You say that, that, that sounds harsh. Well, that doesn't mean he's mean to other women. It just means that he only accepts his wife as his mate. In fact, there's another phrase that I want you to fill in here, and you can choose one of the two. He holds fast or he cleaves, as the King James used, uses, he cleaves to his wife, or he holds fast to his wife. Now, I want you to think about this with me. We've all seen and heard in these last 30 or 40 years, multiple situations where this does not describe a spiritual leader. All too often, we hear and we see of a guy whose his eyes and his and his life is involved with someone besides his wife. And God says, that is not what my church is to be led by. And there's a very big reason for it. And I want you to see it. It's in, it's in Genesis chapter 2. And um, it's also repeated, and this is very interesting to me. Um, this phrase not only shows up in the second chapter of the Bible, right after creation, after God creates man and woman, he also creates this thing called marriage. And he brings the two of them together. And this is the plan from the very beginning of God's design. And there's some reasons for that, which we'll see, that he has designed. Look what it says there on the screen. And I'd like for you to read that out loud together with me. Um, if you would, let's read together. Therefore, a man shall and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now that's in Genesis chapter 2, and then you look and you see Mark chapter 10, who repeats this? Jesus. So everything in the Old Testament is important, but when you see the Old Testament being repeated in the New Testament, there's special attention that we need to give to it, especially when the Lord Jesus is upholding this design of God for which we have as the basis of our society and ultimately the basis of our morality before God. And there's some reasons that we want you to see in this. Um, so this is, the, this is the meaning of it. This, this man is to have a committed, faithful love for his wife that does not extend to any other 
woman in his life. Look at the phrase's importance. Why is this so important? I want you to see why this is so important for the church. And we're about to see some passages of Scripture that I think that you are going to be really blessed by. And it, we've just sung this. We've just celebrated this in song. But the, I want you to see, number one, fill this in. Our God is a God of faithfulness. You can write above that or out to the side. This is his character. This is who he is. He is a God of faithfulness. And his faithfulness is seen throughout the scripture. Just look at the screen. Let these passages pour over you. I've listed them underneath this. But let these passages pour over you. And I'm going to ask you to read a couple of them with me. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Look what it says. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. And what does it say there? The faithful God. Not the unfaithful God that leaves you. But the faithful God who keeps what? covenant and steadfast love with who those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations this is a faithful god look at first corinthians chapter 1 verse 9 so we skip to the new testament look what it says what does it say there at the beginning god is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is your salvation is made possible through the calling into relationship with him. This is a God who is faithful. Look at Exodus 3 verse 4. Uh, excuse me, 34 verse 6. And this is the Lord speaking to Moses. I want you to see this. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and generous, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and what? And faithfulness. This is who God is. Notice with me the next passage. Psalm 36, verse 5. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. The picture of the psalmist is saying God's faithfulness goes beyond this life, goes beyond this present reality that you have in front of you. Look at Psalm 34, verse 4. For the word of the Lord is upright. So this is speaking of his words. What he has said. The word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in what? He's faithful in his work. Psalm 86 verse 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So here the psalmist is quoting from what God had said to Moses in, Psalm 30, or in Exodus 34. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. Let's read it out loud together. You, we see why he is faithful and what this matters to us. Read together with me 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. You see, God's faithful in guarding his people. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Would you read this out loud? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then, look, our sin is forgiven because he is faithful. Look at 1 John 1, 9. Would you read it out loud together with me? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So even the forgiveness, the great need of forgiveness, finds itself back in the fact that he has to be faithful in order to do that, and that's what he is. Now, 2 Timothy 2.13 is beautiful. It provides hope to my heart. Look what it says here. If we are faithless, he what? He remains faithful. Look what it says. For he cannot do what? This is who God is. This is who he is. He's faithful. He's always faithful. He cannot deny himself. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, my Father. O Lord, our Lord. Look what it says there on your outline under number one. God is a God of faithfulness. He is faithful and true all the time in every way. Now, God wants us to know that he is a God of faithfulness. 
Look at number two here, or, un, or underneath number one. God's faithfulness is most clearly seen in his Philadelphia committed and self-sacrificing love. This is how we know that God is faithful. He is so committed to us that he even becomes a man, lives on the earth, is teaching his truth to us. We reject him, and he willingly lays down his life. He self-sacrifices so that we can see what God's love looks like. In Romans 5, it says, but God demonstrated his love for us. He showed us his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? He died for us. You see, this, we, God wants us to see what his love looks like. Look at the next part here underneath this. His, he has a reputation of faithfulness. Excuse me. Um, this is the one most, this is one of the most important things God wants us to know about him. He wants us to see that he has a committed love. This is one of the key things. If you, if, if you miss much of what is ever said in the life of the church, you must not miss this, that God wants us to know that he is a God of committed, self-sacrificing love. And not only that, but notice the next one here. This is one of the most important things God wants us to emulate about him or to put down below emulate copy God wants you to do what he does he wants you to see that self-sacrificing committed love is what he is all about now second part is incredibly important not only is God a God of faithfulness but number two for the life of the church we got to realize we must realize that God's design of marriage between a man and a woman is one of his greatest gifts to creation so that we may better see and understand his self-sacrificing love. Here's the deal. God knew in his wisdom, in his design of all of the universe, that he would, would show his character by making us male and female and giving us the opportunity to see in an earthly example right before our very eyes, even in our own experience, what true love looks like. And marriage gives you that opportunity. Marriage gives you the picture, whether in your own experience or here as a human in our society, looking on at the issue of marriage, you get to see that here two beings come together and learn to sacrifice that the relationship might continue. You see, if, if we don't sacrifice and if we don't love the other person in such a way that you're giving up yourself, then the marriage won't work. That's what God has designed. God has designed that we can see that two come together and become one, have right relationship, and it's through sacrificial, committed love. Now, marriage gives us this picture of God's kind of love because that's what God does with us. That even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This means that Marcy has the grace from God. Marcy has the opportunity to look at Andrew Coleman and all of his sin and all of his weakness and all of his frailty and all of his failings and she has the opportunity to love me anyways. And I have the opportunity to look at her in her imperfectness and to love her in that same way because that's what God has designed so that we can learn what he has done for us. So before you go throwing away marriage, before you go walking away from this thing that comes from Genesis chapter 2, at the beginning of creation, and is reiterated by Jesus before he goes to the cross for our sins, we have to remember what his grand design and the purpose of his grand design. Marriage will show you the love of God unlike many other things in this earthly life. It shows us, it preaches to us what God's love really looks like. And so, if, if this is what God does with marriage, this is why, and fill this in, this is why he loves your marriage. Did you know that God loves your marriage? He loves your marriage because of this. He loves the fact that he's designed it to show you what his love looks like. 
You say, well, Pastor, there is nothing lovable about my marriage. Some of you would say that. Some of you would say, you don't know how hard it is. You don't know how I failed in my marriage. You don't know how my spouse has failed in our marriage. You don't know how hard this is. Well, I would say, well, don't tell me what I know and what I don't know in that regard because you don't know my experience too. You see, anyone that's married has been through difficulty because we're fallen human beings that don't easily mesh and we don't all run around, oh, how can I sacrifice myself today? We just don't, we don't feel that way, right? I mean, the Lord Jesus himself got down in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, Lord, if there's any way to let this cup pass from me, you see, self-sacrifice is painful and it hurts and it doesn't come naturally to us. And even God, in his commitment of this, we see the difficulty of it. But God loves your marriage because he gets to show the world and he gets to show you what committed love looks like. And this is also why in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16, God says that he hates divorce. You see, divorce destroys this earthly example that he's given us. This is why he is for your marriage. This is why he is for forgiveness. This is why he is for grace. This is why he is for forbearance. This is why he is for you laying down your life and that your spouse would come to lay down your, his life or her life, that, he, that the two shall become one and be in right relationship. Now, what's interesting to me, I, I thought this was interesting as I was studying this, in Malachi chapter 2, do you know what Malachi chapter 2 um, is about? It is about Old Testament priests and what they needed to be. So it's very interesting to me that in the New Testament we see that a, a pastor, a, an overseer, is to be a one-woman man. He is to be a committed, self-sacrificing man. And in the Old Testament, we see the idea of this priest is that his, his qualifications in being a priest have to do with his self-sacrificing. It's very interesting that it's the, the great statement of God, how God feels about divorce is found in a chapter that deals with who can be a priest or the condition of the priesthood. And so we, we, we see that marriage is a big deal to God. Look at number three, and this is what brings it together. Christ's church is to be led by men who fill it in, understand this kind of love, and her, who are committed to live this kind of love so God's people can what? Better see him. I want you to see that this is not just you need a good little Sunday school boy to lead your church. You need a guy that has a nice reputation to lead your church. No, it's bigger than that. Hopefully, this creature that is going to lead your church has some idea about how God's love really works. In fact, he needs to not only be a partaker of that, but he needs to be one who is living that. And when you have a man who does not live by that, when you have a man that does not esteem committed love, when you have a man that is not disciplined toward committed love, how can he teach this incredibly important characteristic of God? Now, I'm the first to tell you that, that I am no perfect example of what a pastor ought to be or a husband ought to be. There are many examples including represented by two of the women that are here whose, pastor, whose husbands are with the Lord that I believe were probably far greater examples in that regard than I am. But let me tell you that the church cannot be led by men who disregard the committed sacrificial love of God. And if they cannot live that with their own wife, if they cannot be committed to their own wife and be singly-minded for their, for their own wife, how can they teach the church about this kind of sacrificing, committed love. He cannot. And that's part of the grand picture behind this qualification for who can be a pastor. Notice this with me underneath number three. Elders, pastors must not love the world or the selfish desires of the flesh. They must not be more impressed with the world than they are with God's principles and God's plan. 
They must not be more in love with their own sexual desires or their own desires of things in this life than they are with God's plan and what God has said. Notice the next one here. Elders and pastors must not be fickle. The word fickle, what does that mean? Going back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes hot, sometimes cold. Elders, pastors must not be fickle or weak or double-minded concerning their wife. They must be strong and true in this regard. Otherwise, he's not qualified to be a pastor. I want you to think for a moment with me what happens when a pastor is faithful to his wife and preaches what it means to be faithful in commitments. You see, there's validity in that. But what happens when a guy stands up and he says, well, yeah, you need to be faithful to your life. Now, I wasn't, but, you know, you should be. Is there a problem there? What about when the couple comes and says, hey, we're really thinking about divorce. We just, you know, we were never really in love in the first place. What we thought was love was really just lust, and we admit that now, and so we want out and everything else. And the pastor, it, 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 the pastor has to have the moral, moral authority to say, well, wait a minute. God loves your marriage. God loves who you are. God loves the covenant. And I know it may be bruised and it may be battered and it may be really hard right now, but there's some things that you need to see here about the, what God has designed. He, he hates it when we tear apart his example to us about what it means to forgive and to love and to be unified. But he loves it when he reclaims marriage. We have people in our church right now who have come and they came and this was their last stop before the Broward County Courthouse. And this was their last hope in that regard. They were having so much trouble, they said, well, let's just go to church and see if, see if this will fix it. And I, let me tell you that there are people here today who love their husband or love their wife because God redeemed their marriage. They learned what God's love looks like. They learned the power of forgiveness through the gospel of Jesus Christ. They learned that if God can forgive me of all of my sins, he comes and lives within me to forgive my spouse and to love my spouse despite their imperfectness. Friends, this is the gospel. It's not only to save your soul from hell, but it's also to save your marriage from destruction. And it's also to save your children from the demise of the world that the world has for them. That as we run to God and live how God has called us to live, that we come to find that His principles are true. And His grace is great. And His faithfulness is forever. This is what brings hope to our lives in the midst of our sinful, fallen condition. Notice number four. An elder pastor's marriage life, his marriage life, will either proclaim the gospel or defame the gospel. And we have to recognize that. There have been many pastors who have defamed the gospel of Jesus Christ because they were not committed to their wife. They love somebody else's wife, or they love somebody else's daughter, or they love somebody, somebody else and somebody in, in their own flesh more than they love the plan and the design of God. Now, before we lay everything on, yep, that's the way a pastor ought to be. Yep, pastor, you better keep, your, you know, you better keep yourself pure because I'm watching. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever. Well, why does a pastor need to do that? He needs to do that to be an example for you as a church member. You see, Christians, fill this in, every Christian is called to believe and live the gospel in the same true faithfulness. It's just incredibly important. Don't fold your paper over. It's just incredibly important that a pastor who's saying it and proclaiming it and teaching it, that he be living it. But every Christian is called to this. Every Christian is called to purity. Every Christian is called to self-sacrificing, committed love. Why? Because this is the way God loves. This is who God is. And so, when you flip your page back over, before you fold it over, flip your page back over, look at the two lists 
What should a pastor look like under 1 Timothy? He needs to be above reproach. That's an overarching value. But the first one mentioned, husband of one wife. Over in Titus, husband of one wife. Why? Because at the very beginning, God said, let me show you what sacrificial love. Let me give you something to experience it. And so he gives us husband and wife, male and female. He gives us holy matrimony. And he says, this is going to teach you much about me. This is going to teach you much about how I have forgiven you. This is going to teach you much about how I am faithful to you. I'm faithful to you even when you're unfaithful to me. I'm faithful to you all the time. My love is faithful. You may not be faithful, but I am faithful. And so God is showing us this. Now the church needs to embrace this, not only for the pastors, but friends, Christian, the world ought to look at Christians, biblical Christians, and go, those people know how to love each other. Those people know how to make marriage work. Those people have something that shows me that it's beyond themselves. And that's part of our witness. Jesus said in John 13, 34, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, your marriage preaches the gospel. How about this? Our church family preaches the gospel. I just showed you a few minutes ago a bunch of pictures of community groups. People coming together in homes from many different walks of life. In one home, there may be some rich, there may be some poor, there may be some white, there may be some Hispanic, some black, some Asian, some whatever. And the world begins to watch the way we live. And if we are loving one another, they begin to say, what is going on? Look at that. This is God's grand plan. He wants to show us what his love looks like. He wants to show us all of this in his great grace. So a church needs to be careful that it has leadership. The pastors of the church understand what committed love looks like. Now, I have just preached this message, and it would be good for you to pray that the pastors of this church are committed to self-sacrificing love. It would be good for Mrs. Kerwin, it would be good for Mr. Pinkerton, it would be good for Glory, it would be good for each of you to pray that our church has pastors who understand this, and not only that we have pastors who understand this, but it would be good that we have a whole church that understands self-sacrificing, committed love. Amen? This is the way God has loved you. Let's stand together for prayer.